Hi, this is Maggie. In this video we're going to talk about detecting collisions between objects that are oddly shaped and detecting collisions between two groups of objects rather than simply an object and a group. We'll begin with objects that are oddly shaped. This is the documentation from the Pygame website for pygame.sprite.spritecollide. It takes four parameters. The first is the sprite, and the second is the group. This function will check if the sprite has collided with any of the sprites in the group, and will return a list of the sprites from the group that the sprite has collided with. The function does this by checking if the sprite's rectangles overlap. In fact, it compares sprites using this function, pygame.sprite.collide.rect. You could also use that function if you wanted to check for a collision between two sprites. The third parameter is a boolean, which is not relevant to this conversation, but removes the collided sprites from the group if it's set to true. The fourth parameter, which is optional, is a callback function. And this is what we're going to talk about because this is how you get a little more control over collision detection. A callback function is a function that you pass as an argument. For sprite collide, the callback function that you pass in will be used to check for collisions instead of using the default collide rect, which, again, compares the rectangles of the two sprites. The Pygame library has two callback functions that are built in that we can ask Sprite Collide to use to check for collisions, Collide Circle and Collide Mask. Let's look first at this example called circlecollision.py, which allows the user to move one circle and which reports when the two circles are colliding. The colors around the circles show their rectangles, and I hope that you can see the circles. If you're having trouble seeing them, the circles are perfectly inscribed within the squares. So the circles are not in the corners of the squares, but they're pretty much everywhere else. Now at first we'll use the default collision detection, which is collide rect. And so you can see that as soon as the rectangles, which here are squares, overlap, the program reports a crash. That's the result of a collision being detected in this program. Okay, and now here's the code, and I'm going to comment that out. And I'm going to uncomment this version of the call to pygame.sprite.spritecollide. Notice that I'm passing a fourth parameter, which is pygame.sprite.collidecircle. That's the callback function which will determine whether a collision has occurred between two sprites. Now let's talk about the callback function. This is the name of the function only. We are not putting parentheses after the name, even though it's a function, because we're not calling it. It's going to get called inside sprite collide once for each sprite in the group. So what we do here is give the name of the function to sprite collide so sprite collide can call the function. So it's like any other parameter where we pass in an argument and then the function has access to the value of that argument. Except in this case, instead of just being data, the parameter is a reference to code that can be executed. Now we can't pass in any old function. The function has to be one that can be used inside Sprite Collide. Here is the documentation inside Sprite Collide, part of Pygame. So if for some reason you write your own callback function, the function has to take two sprites as parameters, and it has to return a Boolean result 
like collide rect does. Okay, but back to collide circle. The way this works is it uses the radius property of the sprite to determine collisions. So up in the initializer for the circle sprite class, I set a field called self.radius, and that's what it has to be called to 40 pixels. If you don't set a radius field, the Pygame code will create a radius around your sprite's rect. I want this radius to be the radius of the circle inside the rect. So when we run this and move the circle, Now the rects can overlap without it reporting a collision. It's not until the circles overlap that we get a collision. Okay, but not everything is a circle or a rect. Some things have very weird shapes, and collision detection would look strange if we drew a circle or a rectangle around those things so we can use a different callback function. This example is called maskcollision.py and if I run the program you can see the odd shape of the two pool toys a pineapple and a spiky float. Now I can move the pineapple by pressing the arrow keys and as I move it, you can see where the rectangles overlap, but no report of a collision. I can get them quite close, even though they're odd shapes, until finally they actually overlap the parts that are drawn, and I get a report of a collision. So in the code, we're passing pygame.sprite.collidemask as the callback function to sprite collide. And this creates a mask from the pixels in the image and uses that to determine if there's a collision. This one is very useful for oddly shaped sprites. Now one final example. And this is of two groups. This program is called goatsandweeds.py. And I have a group of goats, which move sort of randomly around the screen, and a group of weeds. And what the program does is checks if any of the goats collide with any of the weeds. When they do, the program reports which goat ate which weed. Calling this function group collide isn't too different from calling sprite collide. We pass in two groups. So here I'm passing in the goats first and then the weeds. And then we pass in two booleans. The first is whether the sprite from the first group should be removed if there's a collision. And the second is whether the sprite from the second group should be removed if there's a collision. So in this case, the first group is goats, and I don't want a goat to disappear if it collides with a weed. The second group is weeds, and I do want a weed to disappear if a goat collides with it, as if the weed has been eaten. And then there is the optional callback function, and here I'm using collide mask. What is returned is perhaps the most complicated aspect of this because we have two groups. What we get back is a dictionary. Let's print that and run the program again.
Okay. And it is enclosed in curly braces, which means it's a dictionary that I'm getting back. And the key is a goat sprite. And the value is a weed sprite enclosed in square braces, which means it's a list. Bear in mind that our goat could collide with more than one weed at a time, and that's why a list. So what I am getting is a dictionary that is keyed on the first group, and the value is a list of items that the key collided with from the second group. What I'm doing in the program is iterating through the dictionary. And then iterating through the list that is the value for the dictionary key. And sending messages to the goat and the weed that are in the dictionary. So goat is going to take on each key value from the dictionary, each goat from the first group in group collide that experienced a collision. The variable weed is going to take on each value from that goat key in the dictionary because those values are in a list. And then I'll send the get name messages to them so I can print out the name of the goat and the name of the weed consumed by the goat. It's important to know specifically which weeds were collided with and which goats collided with them because it's possible that the weeds might give the goats energy or might make them sick or tired and it's possible a goat might get full and not need to eat or very hungry and need to eat it depends on the game of course but you want to understand how to use this dictionary structure that's returned so you can interact with the exact objects from the collision in this follow-up code. I suggest you write a program that checks for collisions using the collide mask or collide circle callback functions, and write a program that checks for collisions between groups of objects, being sure to navigate the structure that's returned. Have fun with it.